Thank you to Hairpin Art Center for being our streaming partner. Any Squared Spotlight Art Talks highlight member and friend artists of all ages and experiences. So um, we're going to start the talk mm -hmm. and everyone welcome to Any Squared Spotlight. Today we have Andrea Kasprick and I'm really excited because we've had Any Squared has had a long term relationship with Andrea and um, as an artist, as a collaborator and Andrea has been in many, many shows that we've organized, including solo shows at Art at Coles and shows at you know, in different locations, um, including against the fence and all these different things. I think, uh, I think um, I remember meeting Andrea at parties and openings long before uh, <laughs> she was part of any square. 2010. <laughs> Huh? I think, 2010. 2010. I think yeah, I think that's right. The Milwaukee Arts Fest. That's she right. That's that, right. Oh, need yeah. arts. Yeah. yeah. And then, um, and then since then, Andrea has done so many things. Andrea is one of the founders of Agitator, Agitator Gallery, one of our sister organizations, and also has co-hosted um, the Figure Tuesdays for a very long time, uh, you know, at different times, um, and uh, is very much a part of doing things at Lil Street Gallery or Lil Street in terms of painting classes and different things like that. And um, and uh, I uh, lost my train of thought, but, but anyway, so welcome Andrea, and I want you to tell your own story. Okay. I'm very happy that you're here and, I, and I'm excited to hear the talk you want to give tonight. Okay, thanks Tracy for the introduction. Um, I'd like to thank you again for this chance for me to talk and the other artists who visited Any Squared um, and uh, for having me in shows and the other artists. And um, I haven't been participating or active in Agitator the last few years because I'm with Gretchen, who's to my right on the screen here at least. And uh, we've both been very active. She's been super active. She's like carrying the entire agitator on her shoulders at times. <laughs> but uh, we've all been active, but um, so we've been quite busy with that project. And um, so I haven't been able to um, visit and be as busy at um, any squared as a result. Um, so that's what's been going on. It's not, I'm avoiding you or <laughs> terrible. It's just, I'm busy with another group. Um, we, know, thank, we know we love you. But thank you for offering Agi uh, Any Square to us. It's a great place to meet other artists in the city, make connections, and also maybe even join other groups and activities. Um, I don't know how to start my talk. I, I, you gave this handout sheet suggestions for artists what to talk about and what issues to suggest address. And the first thing is like materials and what's your focus. And so my primary focus is oil painting. And you can see some behind me here hanging on the wall. Um, I've got a big collection at home, just turning into a problem. I'm running out of space. So I need to start selling or giving things away or recycling them. But, um, but I should say also, I, I sometimes I keep old paintings on the wall, sometimes because I like them or I think they're good. And sometimes I realize they're poorly done and what I would call ineffective or failures, but it's, it's good to face your failure and past work from the past. And so you can see progress over time. So things I did 10 or 15 years ago or 20, I look at them now and then I see where I've come to at this point. So I think it's important to keep work from the past and it shows you how much progress you've made, hopefully <laughs> in your painting career. Um, 
Um, yeah, so my main focus is painting. Also another focus is figure drawing and Gretchen is also very much into figure drawing and we're both involved with uh, Figure Tuesdays, which started at your place at Any Squared and then it moved to Cole's Bar and has jumped around and is an agitator gallery. Now it's online virtual. Um, so that's the other part of my practice is figure drawing. Um, and I see myself as a figurative painter a narrative painter who tells stories through my paintings. Um, other things I've done include um, woodcut relief printing, etching. Um, and I've also branched out into ceramics, clay. So my goal is to make clay figurines. I think Gretchen's exploring that too at Little Street Art Center. And um, at Little Street Art Center, I, I usually go there too, once or twice a week for, um, I would go for figure and portrait painting. But um, unfortunately, a lot of these live classes with models have been shut down during the pandemic because people talk and they can get crowded. So <clears throat> uh, it's been shut down the past year. So I've um, tried an alternative, which is clay ceramics and constructing, it, making a figurine out of clay. Um, so, um, and before, uh, you know, I should say, I, I've been active in art since childhood, probably like many of us. And I was making little books and drawings when I was a kid and even comics, with a comic character like called Vav, V-O-V. But, um, and then I drifted away from like making drawings and I shifted to painting tiny, tiny, like um, 33 millimeter lead figurines, ancient Greeks, <laughs> and, uh, and then plastic tiny Napoleonic soldiers. Um, um, I think the military, it's, it's always not a good thing, but I think it's really gone downhill now with camouflage and drab uniforms in the past everyone would be colorful and uh, <laughs> and it was a way to stand out. So you don't, you know, take down your friends with friendly fire, <laughs> you have distinctive colors and uniforms. So it's a good idea, but um, aesthetically good too. But um, so that was my interest for time was painting little figurines. And, um, and then in high school, I, I, I signed up for four years of art and uh, that was sort of a challenge because you miss study period or free period. Art studies were usually a period and a half. Um, so I took four years of art, but, um, and uh, I've saved some of my paintings. So I painted an acrylic in high school and made collages. Um, but I always felt that I couldn't handle figure. I, I, I couldn't figure it out, how to draw figures. And of course we didn't have figure painting, one of the rules. Of, High school art is no nudity allowed. And in our case, it wasn't even people wearing bathing suits or <laughs> warm fitting clothing. I guess that wasn't allowed as well. Um, and then I, I, I went to college and I, I drifted away from art. I shifted my focus to writing and got a degree in English and Slavic languages and literature. I was teaching writing at the city colleges. <clears throat> and um, at some point I became um, disillusioned or I lost interest in studying all the time, writing and reading. And some of my artworks I have will reflect that phase of my life. Um, but um, so I, I decided to turn to art like a past interest. And uh, one of my motivations for that was I wanted to be able to communicate with more people and interact with more people. Um, sort of the world of academia, at least on the college level, can be very limiting and you're only in contact with a few people, a classroom, a very small audience at best because who understands some abstruse writer or topic from the 18th century or 19th century. So you're very restricted and limited in who you interact with, who you appeal to, um, unless you sort of step out like someone like Cornell West, who's like a scholar and an activist and attends protests and writes popular books. That's a little different, but that's an exception to most uh, academics. Um, 
So I, I, I didn't want that life. And um, the other thing I discovered, I, I realized since childhood I was different and um, I felt like I was hiding in not the, it used to be the closet or uh, away from people because I'm transgender, but then it would be, I thought to myself, I'd be hiding not in the closet, but in a tiny little office at the university, locked up, studying, writing, taking notes, or in a library. <laughs> um, so I, I, I thought, you know, moving from one closet into sort of another was not the life for me. So I decided on art. Um, and uh, at that point, um, I continued teaching though, and then I. Uh, I, I stopped teaching because teaching, as some of you know who have taught, can be exhausting. It's a drain on your energy. Um, some people are really dedicated to it and devoted to it, which is great. Um, but I, I thought too that for me, it was took too much my, of my energy from making art and creativity. So I thought I, I, I have to choose one or the other. So I, I chose art as opposed to teaching. Um, and um, so I, uh, this was in the mid nineties. And then, so initially I just worked in color pastel and, and I realized I had limitations I faced and I'll show some of these images from the past. And then I, I realized I should really get some art education. Uh, I appreciate outsider artists and self-taught artists, but I didn't feel I was one who could be comfortable with myself if I remained self-taught. And I wanted to make certain images and present things that I, simply was not capable of doing. I, I lacked the skills or knowledge. And I thought I, I, I need to learn these techniques and improve my figure drawing. And, and so I began to take classes um, in the early 2000s at a place called the Figure Drawing Workshop in Chicago. It was on, it's jumped around town. And it was, um, uh, the teacher was a cranky old man who was like an eternally retired graphic artist. <laughs> <laughs> he must have retired in the 70s or 80s when they computerized it, but um, he always characterized himself as a retired. He was a nice guy, George Sotos. And so I took figure drawing there, and then I, uh, I from there, I, I jumped to the adult education program at the School of the Art Institute in the two, latter 2000s. They have a pretty good painting and drawing certification program there. And then I actually decided to um, get a second degree as a middle-aged person and join all the youngsters um, at the School of the Art Institute. <laughs> um, so I, I took a degree in three years and because uh, I'd already taken a lot of the core classes. Hi, Mariana. And, um, and this was 2010 to 13. And, I mostly did painting and drawing, a little printing, and art history. And, um, and then I came to Any Squared in 2014, 15. I was in Logan Square, so it was nice to find an art community. And in 2017, Agitators started planning and then it formally got set up in September, 2017. And so that's sort of my life art story. Um, any questions about that or any responses to it or I'll just move on to maybe presenting some of my work. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions right now? Just before we move on? I'll just start showing images. So <laughs> Go like ahead. An art, talk, an art talk or an art book without images is worthless, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> let's see the pictures. <laughs> let's see the pictures, okay. Uh, let's start, okay. Um, Okay, so this is my art talk. I made a short slideshow and then I'll jump to my website and Instagram page. Um, so one of the issues that I ask is if figurative and narrative painting is still relevant in art. And um, so here are two recent paintings from uh, two, three years ago. It's called Facing Stigma. The figure on the left is um, the lonely anarchist and the figure on the right is Facing Stigma. And so it's, it's a self-portrait. So it's essentially on the left, it's me in the past. Um, as a result of being in the closet alone, I uh, was isolated and would sort of read a, a material that was, you know, 
revolutionary and contest the current order and stuff, but it was all alone. So I was all by myself. Um, and then on the right, this figure, sort of the, the figure facing you, it's facing stigma. So it's represents symbolically overcoming um, sort of fear of poison or stigma, the, the sort of the diamondback rattle, rattlesnakes. Um, and it, for me, it represents a coming to terms with myself, with the snakes. Um, and let me see the next Is that the, slide. Yeah, just go, to, yeah, there you go. The next slide, these are uh, paintings by Kerry James Marshall. So these are sort of iconic paintings of uh, African-Americans, very black people who um, can inspire fear and white culture. And he sort of presents them in a heroic, iconic manner uh, in painting. And so the, this was an artist who like influenced me and my selection of poses and, and, and paintings, uh, a current painter. And the next slide, I, I wanna show Franz von Stuck, who was a German symbolist painting from late um, 19th, early 20th century. So here we see the image of the snake and the, the nude woman, and it's sort of a sexy, femme fatale, um, sort of men projecting the power of women to destroy them and uh, poison them and to ruin them. <laughs> um, so uh, it's all, uh, I guess, um, projection. It's also at the same time sort of uh, titillating and erotic and sort of voluptuous. Um, and, and so I, I wanted to take this image of a snake, um, but but treat it more seriously, not for a voluptuous and erotic distraction or titillation, but to take it seriously. And I, I, I think in terms of painting, it's um, people from different backgrounds and situations can take images like this. And it, ultimately this derives from Adam and Eve and the serpent and the serpent who tempted Eve and the serpent who tempted Adam to, to eat the apple, presenting women with the snake as a symbol of evil and temptation. And so I, I think people from, I think perhaps from different backgrounds can, can present these images in a new sort of context and way that hasn't been presented before. Um, so I, I just wanted to show that. And see the next slide. Again, this is uh, the scene of Adam, Eve, and the serpent, um, a German artist, relief print. We see the snake coiling around the tree, Adam and Eve. And I, I did this large print a few years ago. I took a workshop in St. Louis. It's called Reaching for Honey. And here we have like a snake, a man, a woman, a goat, a cat, and a honeycomb. And um, I want to retell this story of temptation and sort of a new presentation where the snake is not presented as a source of evil or temptation or destruction. It's one of several creatures or animals who are all after the same sweet <laughs> honey that all appeals to us, the goat, the cat, the humans. Um, we're all on the same plane. Um, I don't want to so, uh, so this is sort of my, some of my art comments on and interacts with art from the past. And uh, let's see the next slide. Uh, okay, so here's uh, recent paintings, this Vitruvian series. Leonardo da Vinci did this ink drawing um, where he investigated this um, a combination of a square and a circle. So. The circle represents infinity, the spirit, the square represents materiality, the earth, and the combination of the two sort of represents humanity and the universe or man and nature um, and how man is a reflection, a macrocosm and a microcosm of the larger whole, the universe. And uh, this architect from Rome, Vitruvius said, uh, if you go to the midpoint of uh, human's navel, um, you can draw a circle and a square 
from that midpoint. And actually, though, Leonardo figured out that you actually have to shift the legs of the figure and the arms to make this true. <laughs> so you have to adjust this uh, proportion slightly. So he's, uh, but, but it's an image of perfection and the ideal and the notion of man as, as sort of a bridge between uh, material and spirit world. And so I, I took this image and I put it into different contexts in, in four uh, different paintings. And these are almost finished, but um, <clears throat> uh, it's, it's people in, in the context of different imaginary scenes of nature or, or some imagined scene. Um, I, I, I'll just leave it at that. If people have questions about the symbolism, I, I can go into detail. Um, the next image is also a recent painting, um, uh, the gender polarizing monster. So I, I think in this image, I was perhaps influenced by a jack-o'-lantern, um, the carved pumpkins with a candle inside and the scary face, and also Fritz Lang's Metropolis, the monster that consumes uh, workers. Uh, <laughs> which is unfortunately uh, still true to varying degrees in different places. But, um, and this image is based on uh, a practice in ancient Carthage where uh, apparently infants were sacrificed to Baal uh, or Moloch. Um, um, in times of crisis or as an annual ritual, I, um, um, so I, I took this image to sort of uh, represent my sense of frustration or challenge. I'm, I'm the figure holding the ball above this sort of monster that consumes, can consume people and, and throwing this yin yang, yin and yang ball of sort of gender balance. I was having trouble balancing. So I was gonna throw it into the, the monster's mouth and destroy it. Um, and, and, and after I finished this painting, I, that's, that's what, caused like the, the previous paintings, these uh, sort of uh, triumphant celebratory paintings, positive uh, paintings. I thought people would say to me, all your stuff is like all about conflict, war, violence, uh, negativity. And, I, and I, I thought, well, I should do some positive work too. And says it's, it's not all negative and conflict and violence and, and all that. So, <laughs> um, so I, I find sometimes doing one type of painting will lead to another type type of painting. And it's sort of like on a record album, you don't, well, I guess you can, if you wanna make all your uh, songs or pieces over the top, fast, hard, uh, aggressive, you can do that. But I don't know if listeners are ready for like a full album of that sort of music. Occasionally the songs can be peaceful, reflective, slow down the beat and tempo. And I think similarly in art, if you prepare a show, not everything is in your face, aggressive, violent, and full of action and adventure. So it's just a sort of a thematic notion of introducing balance in a sort of a selection of moods and images. Um, and here's another selection on the right, or on the left, um, more sac all my sacrifice paintings, I made four of them. I sort of obviously got it very interested in the theme and decided to make variations of it. Um, and also this, um, there's another painting here, these two figures playing catch with the yin yang ball, it might be hard to see. But so this was in a response to, I, I showed the two figures standing alone and I, I, I thought um, you should pair up with another figure to show there can be um, cooperation, alliance, interaction with one another as opposed to just isolation, a proud stance alone. Um, um, if, if anyone has questions about these, I, I can go back to them, but um, it's sort of the same principle of overcoming a sense of internal fear of this sort of monster. And I'm sure if someone is a Freudian psychologist, they could see my fears of engulfment or absorption here too. So, you know, I'm, I'm sure that's going on too. 
Um, but um, as long as it feeds the artistic uh, inspiration and production, that's fine. I mean, and, I'm, yeah. and our artists with some internal conflicts is a good thing. It can generate interesting work. <laughs> um, here's some more conflict <laughs> from paintings. Uh, from when I ended art school in 2013, I graduated. This was the wood chopper was sort of my final uh, graduation piece. It unfortunately wasn't my graduation piece because uh, they forced you to put your graduation show on in like March or April, and you only graduate in May. And um, uh, um, but I guess there's lots of people graduating, and so everyone has to get their chance. So as, as a result, it happens in March, but my best painting came in May. And so this was a obviously sort of a Freudian interpretation of the ax, the naked figure, the adolescent. So the, the theme here is the castration complex of Freud. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I laugh about it now, but when I was 12 or 13, it was um, a very sort of disturbing traumatic experience for me. So this is sort of looking back at it in a symbolic manner as an adult, um, reflecting on this, uh, putting it into symbols and imagery. Um, and on the right, we have the book battle. So this is a image of life in undergraduate or in college, reading all the time, studying. Um, at times it felt like all I'm doing is reading and fighting with myself. and. Uh, uh, I, I'm thinking back at the time in retrospect, it would have probably been wise to maybe take a break from school and just have a regular job and interact with regular people. <laughs> and uh, instead of life turning into a hothouse of just combat and ideas and, and so on. Um, but again, so this is using symbols, creating a narrative, a story, um, to tell a story. And I, I have my story in these paintings, but I, I'm fine with other people creating and telling their own stories, looking at these paintings. That's, I, I wanna open it, make, make this everyone's story. So every, everyone can see their story in these paintings. I, I, I hope is my expectation. If not, um, maybe it's just a interesting and compelling painting, whatever it means, it, it doesn't matter uh, from an aesthetic perspective or whatever. Andrea, these are these are quite large, those paintings. Uh, yeah, let me go back. Yeah, yeah, this one's like five feet by three feet. Um, this one's yeah, much smaller. I think that it's very, it, we do not understand the scale of these paintings um, from the slides. That's Oh, I'm right, saying. right. Yeah, yeah, I should show them in context. And yeah. I, yeah I, no, I mean, it's okay. I, I'm excited to know what this. Yeah, one of the things like. in art school, I, I, people who've gone to art school or, or have seen art school artwork, is that um, students are encouraged to work large and they can work large. But once you're on your own, unless you have a large van or truck uh, like Holiday Jerry, or <laughs> most of us don't have such a vehicle, uh, a pickup or whatever, um, it's hard to get these five foot by three foot uh, works around town to show them or sell them or share them. And uh, so I, I've reduced my size until I maybe my, get a, a heavy duty trailer. Maybe I'll, then I'll be prepared to I, tow my I, works around town. <laughs> my friend Mary Ellen Croteau would limit her size to four by four, That's but increments. Oh. And, and would do pieces together because she could fit it into her car. Okay. So it was like, it was a practical thing. So she could have eight by eight, but they would be four pieces. Right. You know? right. I mean, some people, uh, oh, it's the cat. <laughs> um, Tracy's like, what is that? Yes, that. exactly. <laughs> but, but, but I think that like size is sometimes a practical thing. You it know, is. it's interesting that, that you say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess the other aspect, too, is if you have a large studio, I mean, you need a large vehicle or a sturdy big bike trailer. Or, but if you have a large studio, you, you can allow yourself to make big works. But most people, unless they have a big home or a big studio, it's stuff piles up. 
and so maybe someday I'll, I'll uh, have a studio space and uh, but but I'm okay with making smaller work. But it was it was give to good to give bigger work a try. It's it's fun. Um, next slide is more conflict and. Here it's an indication of like my process. Sometimes I, I go through all these formal steps of making a graphite pencil drawing and an ink and watercolor drawing or version. Um, I don't always do this, but sometimes it's um, good to do this, uh, good for sales. It's more affordable and you can sell this work, um, the paintings. Um, at least my larger ones are harder to sell because they, they cost more. Um, it's an issue. Um, I've noticed that you do studies quite often. Like oh, yeah. you have like re different kinds of rethinking of your mm -hmm. imagery over and yeah. over again, but they slightly are changed, but they're similar compositions. Yeah, there's this notion that an artist looks like stares at a giant blank canvas and creates. And uh, maybe some artists do that, but I'm not one of them. <laughs> well, you do, except you're extremely <laughs> methodical and oh. about it. <laughs> Very intimidating to have a, face a big canvas and think I have to fill this up somehow. And without a sketch, I, I, I can't do that. Some artists can, but I'm not one of them. Um, so that's on the, part of your process. Yeah, on the left here, we have this, another image of, this is graduate school, so. If you go to graduate school, you read books all the time. Um, unless you're in science, maybe you're in the laboratory all the time with a microscope and test tubes. But in the humanities and uh, social sciences, history, you'll spend your life reading. Um, so this is influenced by William Blake, um, like a, a English, British poet from the late 19th century um, who was criticized for being expressionist. Um, emphasizing certain features of the figure. And he was shunned from the Royal Academy of Art as a result of uh, doing his expressionist uh, exaggeration of his figures, but um, he's more well-known than other artists from the Royal Academy of Art of London <laughs> at this point. Um, so yeah, I spent a lot of time reading and, and so another painting about my past. And then on the right, there's a, graphite drawing, the bookstorm, again, surrounded by books, books all over the place. I like the title. <laughs> <laughs> I actually did a nice watercolor painting of this, but it's sold. Uh, at one of the, I think, holiday sales at the Art Institute, students are given a chance to sell their work and people can step in. And I think it's usually held in December and around Easter. So it's a good chance to share and sell your work. Um, and here is on the left, an image of a recent clay figurine that I made. It's about 11 inches tall. It's hollow. And uh, there's a little snake there. And this, I think I just made this last winter and I'd like to make more, um, but it's a challenge. You have to learn about how to work with clay and how to allow it to dry and you need to hollow it out. And at some point you feel like you, you're can, making a Frankenstein monster. So all these, the main parts like the arms, the head, the chest and the legs, you would cut off once you assemble it and then you'd hollow it out um, because the past a certain point, the clay can't be solid. It needs to be hollow. It's um, a larger size. Yeah, that was weird when I did that too. I had no idea that that was a part yeah. of the process. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, I would try to like, I, I still would like to try sculpting, but I, I imagine that would be a challenge too, to have a block of marble or rock and figure out how to get a figure or a face from that or a head. Um, on the right is the statue, the statue of Dionysus in marble. It says the arms and legs were restored. So this is a, an image from ancient Greece and Rome in, the, in which I imagine at least in, on a certain level of society or a certain belief system, this sort of androgynous figure was accepted or even revered, uh, worshiped and sort of a figure of respect and admiration Whereas in modern times, 
figures transgender in modern societies have become sort of, well, until very recently shunned or avoided or hidden. So um, I just thought I'd bring that up in the job. Here's another image of more conflict. <laughs> and on the left, the fall, this is a, again, a fairly large painting, like three and a half feet by two feet, the fall. So this is sort of what I felt like when I was about 12 or 13, <laughs> um, sort of in desperate straits. Um, reflecting on it, re more recently, The Dark Awakening, uh, these two paintings are paired together. Um, I think everyone goes through this, unfortunately, in our, or many teens, young adults, children go through this. Um, so as an adolescence, I mean, part of adolescence is the awakening of sexuality and the development of secondary sexual characteristics and a sense of uh, desiring sex and experiencing it. And unfortunately in our society, we don't have any sort of formal public or even private ritual in which young people, adolescents are introduced into the world of adult sexuality and feelings and experiences. And so a lot of kids, teens just face this alone. And I, I, I'm sure most are um, troubled by it and they don't know what to do with their feelings and how to handle it. So it's, it's a really disturbing time for many of us um, that we don't have such a ritual or some sort of process to, to deal with this. Um, uh, and it doesn't seem to be, well, it's changed somewhat. There's some sex education, but I think it's still a problem. Uh, but it's also a really big problem for people who are different if you're gay or lesbian or transgender and you're alone and scared. And I mean, every, we're all scared at this point, but if you're different, you, you're even more scared. Like, who in the world am I? What's going on with me? And you're terrified and even traumatized. So, so I wanna think back at this time when you're um, just awakening and sort of the dark awakening is the sexual awakening. And it's dark because it's alone and isolated, and I, I think the only solace or sort of calm I found was, you know, through art, through science fiction, fantasy. Um, I found reassurance and comfort in this sort of imagery in the, the world of nature. Um, um, so these figures in these spheres represent their isolation from everything, they're alone. And then the animals, the owl and the goat, there's these sort of friendly spirit animals and nature that you can find comfort and solace in. Um, I'm sure there's more going on here from a Freudian psychological perspective, but um, I think it's an interesting painting and sort of compelling. So I, I'll leave it at that. Um, let me jump to the next set of paintings. Uh, again, reflecting on the past. So heading for trouble um, I took this class called The Dream um, in 2010. It, it was very good for me because I had lots of dreams, some of them quite dark. <laughs> I'm sure we all have our share of dark dreams. It's part of being human. Um, but heading for trouble, I, I thought I'd present in symbolic form uh, myself at the age of 12 or 13. So I'm this little figurine, figurine here on the raft. And uh, I'm not in control of the raft. It's uh, drifting through some rapids, fast water, and it's gonna go either to the right or the left. And I don't know which way to go. <laughs> and we see this tree here and uh, it's captured this moon or banana and a pterodactyl. Um, so it's, it's not a source of comfort. Instead of it's, it's a trap and dangerous. So this is sort of, on one level, uh, how my life felt in my imagination, a scary place. Um, I was out of control and uh, feared the future instead of look, looking forward to it. Um, on the right, I have this, this is also a very large painting. It's like five foot by three. It's called the tower. It's inspired by surrealism. Uh, the painting on the right, I would say, is inspired by also surrealism, maybe perhaps by cubism a bit, expressionism, um, German expressionists. Um, but on the right, the tower is inspired by de Chirico, Giorgio de Chirico. He was a, a 
Italian artist originally from Greece. Um, he inspired and can be considered sort of the unofficial founder of the surrealist movement. And he would take these images of a tailor's dummy and make it look more human. And I was looking at his images a lot and you can sort of see the head of this giant tower figures, perhaps influenced by De Chirico. And it's made of all these tiny little facets. And uh, for me, this represents um, how I felt say in high school, college where I lived sort of a, a life a lot like in fiction, science fiction, fantasy, um, serious literature too at, at some point. And, but, but it was all about um, the aesthetic experience and finding some sort of uh, comfort and solace in that as opposed to people my own age because I, I was, I, I mean, I had some friends, but I, I mostly kept myself. I was self-conscious alone. And, and so my world was found, you know, peace and sense of self through art, through literature, images and, and so on. And so, so this is sort of a sad commentary. I'm thinking symbolically of, um, you know, life as an adolescent and early young adult. For me, that's what it represents. I, I, but it's very, again, this image is, is wide open to interpretation and I'm happy with other people reading into it, whatever they want to read into it, as long as they enjoy it and, and find some sort of stimulation or um, comfort or, or whatever they want from it. Um, I'm, I'm fine with that. I love the tower. Oh, thank you. Yeah, this is one of my favorite pieces. Or, or, or uh, I have a big audience for it. No, this one, this one in person, it, it's, it's, it's a, you know, it's a semi larger painting, but it's yeah, in a, person. It is a person. There's a lot of details and, and like, like all artwork, especially painting, it looks so much more dynamic in person. Yeah, it looks like it's breathing in person. You want to go up and talk to it. Oh, wow. <laughs> it's just like, it's really, yeah, the form is very like tactile. Yeah, I was thinking of some sort of like, that it's a living thing too. It's made out of like straw and like biological or uh, sentient parts or something. Let's see if I have another slide here. Oh, more slides. Okay, uh, on the left. So when I started art again, I, I'd taken a break. I, I graduated from high school in the 80s and then I, I had a long break from art and started again in the mid 90s. And uh, um, so I, I worked with you know black and white and color pastel, color pencil, um, which makes sense. And uh, so, but uh, on the left is fear of the dark. So this was how I felt in 1996, this owl on, owl on the, behind the shoulder of this woman um, sort of represents how I felt at the time. I was um, uneasy and uh, anxious, fearful of what was within me. And so it was fear of the dark. Uh, as a joke, I also thought of calling this the reign of feminine terror. <laughs> um, and at the time, I should also say I was part of this group called the Living Circle. It was a small group of perhaps five to 10 people. It was like a discussion spirituality group um, of GLBT people talking about their personal experiences. And it involved some art therapy, so you could sketch or draw. And then I would work on my own on these larger uh, drawings or artworks alone. Um, so that was sort of influential in my process and determined a certain direction of my art, which has continued till this day where there's some sort of this spirit, um, symbolic spiritual artwork as it's continued. Uh, on the right is this uh, large color pastel drawing called Irradiating Love. So at some point I, I, I was coming out as a transgender person and uh, at 95, 96, 97, uh, you know, a, a while back now, but um, so I had a lot of energy, uh, good and bad. And um, at times I, I felt like I had these mystic experiences, out of body experiences, uh, where I'd feel these uh, 
I'd have all this tension and energy would build up and then there'd be a release and uh, emotional release. And uh, I, I would call them mystic experiences. Um, sometimes they would stay with me for several days. I would feel a sense of elation or relief. They're quite intense. Um, and so this is sort of a, an attempt to represent my mystic experiences, mystic experience of my heart opening up um, in different directions and sort of embracing the world. And, uh, and this is a, a common feature of mystic experiences, is, is a sense of oneness and reaching out and uh, feeling it at one with everyone, um, a loss of the ego. Um, Oh, that's the end of the slideshow. <laughs> so any, any questions about any of these works or if anyone, I, I can go to the next segment of my. I, I wanted to ask, these are some super general questions. Oh, sure. And, and um, you and I may have talked about this already, but like, like there's, there's definitely, and I don't know if you can answer it because we all have our preferences and stuff, but you, you love warm colors and stripes or some sort of like that pattern is also something that appears in a lot right. of your work and which which is great because i personally i love warm colors too and i i have a thing for stripes too and i'm not entirely sure why but i don't know do you know what what you're really drawn to about that i mean or what it comes from or i, I think the, like the warm color for me it represents emotional energy of warmth or love or um, anger it could even express so it can ex it's emotional primarily color and uh, it's a way of like speaking or expressing emotion uh, the intense colors um good or bad um the stripes i i think that's i now that you said it i i think sometimes maybe i over rely on it too much but i think stripes as you know you know any graphic designer or artist um if you introduce lines, especially diagonal lines into a painting, it, it creates a sense of movement. So I, I think it's the, the line, the, the stripes are a compositional device. It's very distinctive. Oh, like, okay. Especially the ones that you're doing now with the big heads with the, oh, oh, I don't know oh. if they're horns or, or what they are, but the yes, they're, horns. Like, they're, they're so horns. cool looking. I mean, okay. they get the, for me, they look like a carnival funhouse ride, which is like, I don't know, I dig that. <laughs> so like, so yeah, it's just like, it's again, it's very, it's like, that is very Andrea. <laughs> okay, thanks. Yeah, I, I yes, you know, yeah, they're horns. And I, I think it's for stripes, diagonal lines and introduce movement into painting more than anything else. Um, Melanie says, um, uh, the sacrificial work is compelling, beautiful, and disturbing. Feels archetypal. So that's Yes, it. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, so, uh, huh, go ahead, Andrea. Oh, oh well, I, I think some of it represents, a, hopefully, a, a stage where you want to put an end to something or an end or stop to something i want to end the sacrifice or stop it mm -hmm. and, and so it's trying to take a stand be decisive resolve to do something in my mind i i have a i i was very surprised when you were going through the slideshow how much you have historical art references in your work I should have known. <laughs> I should. I don't know why I didn't notice before. It's very. It's a. Uh, you do have like. You do have archetypal art references, like certain kinds of ways of putting the patterns on the way you're doing the stance. The like. I didn't realize you had had those historical references. Yeah, I, I don't know if they're direct or I, I actually look at one piece and then say, I'm going to do this in my piece, but I, I do, I'm still a nerd and, and I read like serious art books, you know, I read the, read the biography of Grant Wood, who did American Gothic and, and so on. So I, I, I look at images and I read about them. So it's in my head. So I've always noticed that you think about things a lot. Yeah. So and invariably, hopefully it comes out. <laughs> It does, it does. And I think that, uh, I know that it was kind of like, it's been illuminating to understand some more deeply 
the deeper narratives in your paintings that you referenced here. And I know you want to share some more stuff. Yeah, and there's there's a link you can find it on on, on the Facebook invite. Um, so I, for Agitator Magazine, so Agitator Gallery. So we've gone online. We're virtual, so we don't, we can't do anything. Well, we don't want to do anything in person. It's not safe. Yes. We want to survive and be safe and not get sick, um, or even die. But um, so, just... so we're doing online shows, online activities. And one of those activities include, now include an, a, a magazine. So we share ideas and uh, what we're up to. And so I, I wrote like a, you know, five, six pages about my recent paintings. So if you can, there, there's more details about what I think, yeah. how I react to them, if anyone wants to look at that. I just uh, put the link in the chat for everyone. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, did you want to share your website? Yeah, yeah. What else did you want to talk about? Did anyone have any more questions before we move on? So I'll just mention a few uh, recent images. So this is called the portable burden. So this is another symbolic narrative. Um, and the, the story here is uh, sometimes if you spend too much time alone and think about yourself and your situation, um, it can become burdensome or oppressive. And uh, so that's basically the story here. <laughs> and I actually worked on the pencil sketch for this image at Tracy's at Any Squared um, a while back, like five years ago before um, the wave of, of, of uh, young teens and adults, which was a good thing, came. And uh, so I, I, I actually, did a lot of sketching there and would uh, make these sketches, some of which turned into paintings. Mm -hmm. Here's another piece. So I, I took my print and I turned it into a painting, uh, Reaching for Honey. Let's see, it's, that's the series I showed at Agitator, Facing Stigma. Uh, this is a piece from uh, like a landscape with a figure this is from uh, art school, 2012 or 13. Uh, those are baobab trees, <clears throat> very interesting trees that grow in Madagascar. This is called the Spirit Guardian. I think Melanie has this artwork painting. This is another example of the sort of symbolic art. Um, this was uh, Waiting for a Friend, a large painting. This was uh, a symbolic painting shown at I think at my graduation show at art school in 2013. Um, unequal alliance or on, so I, I did, I used to do some abstract work and um, some of which turned out, I, I did some erasing here, experimented. Um, my mom has this piece now. Uh, she only likes my abstract stuff because the Figurative stuff is too much violence and nudity and conflict, and she can't handle that. <laughs> well, I, I should say a lot of Americans can't. It's still a puritanical country, and people, uh, I guess, look at nudes on the internet, but not in their living room. <laughs> uh, uh, so this is a, a figure, uh, St. Francis and the Beggars. So this is a, a copy. Uh, at reduced size, so sometimes for homework practice in art school, they, they have you make copies of famous paintings. Uh, this is up at the Art Institute, this painting, but it's actually, it's um, El Greco, but it's actually made by his students. They don't have the actual El Greco at the museum, although it did come to the museum at a show recently, <laughs> this painting. Uh, this is from high school. This is cubism really appealed to me in high school. This was a, a cubist inspired painting from high school, which is at my mother's. This is was done in acrylic. Um, so Andrea, these are all on your website too. So if people want to yes, look at them in detail, no, they can. Um, another symbolic painting. Uh, another copy. Um, is this uh, this is Jose Orozco, um, the assassination of Zapata. This is up at the Art Institute. 
I really admire his uh, mural work. Uh, this is a, a large copy, 25% reduced, so it can fit through doorways and onto a pickup truck. Um, this is on our wall in the apartment. It's awesome. I mean, all the these are, but. <laughs> yeah, 1949 Max Beckman. It's the centerpiece of a trip to your three paintings. It's it's humongous. It's it's uh, five. It's this is like six foot by six foot, and uh, actually shrunk at twenty five percent. And otherwise, it would be hard to get through doorway standard doorways. <laughs> um, so this was also a you know copy a master assignment at art school. Um, well, this is a little panel, you know, uh, sixteen by twelve. Um, that yin yang ball and the figure casting down the ball. And I didn't do anything with this image for 10 years. And finally, wow. I started making paintings using it as a reference. And so this is the root of the stuff that you were, you're recently working on. Yeah, this, this I have a, I did make a painting of. This is No Trespassing, another egg tempera painting on wood panel. Another abstract work, abstract, abstract, uh, semi-abstract. Oh, so here's a painting assignment. Here's my brother. He's playing cards with his friends in my parents' basement. And uh, so this person, this guy lost and um, lost the game. And, and this is a large painting too. It's uh, This was my first attempt to make such a big painting. And I, I could sense, boy, I've got a long way to catch up with those Renaissance masters. <laughs> I don't know if I ever will, but uh, it's worth a try. Um, What's the size, Andrea? This is about four feet by three feet. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's quite big. And uh, that's my cat. <laughs> He's been making an appearance on the video. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this is actually a remarkable likeness too. You know how hard it is to <laughs> face, let alone an animal's face, but that's exactly his face. Yeah, his eyes are so expressive and uh, carry so much, so much feeling. It's, uh, it's too much. Uh, this is another symbolic figure painting. Uh, this is sort of a dark painting, symbolic. Uh, this is actually sort of, I, I tried to, I mean, a lot of my paintings are about fantasy and symbolism of um, imaginary worlds. and. This is too, but this is, I, you know, in the, unfortunately we're having all these mass shootings in this country. And this is the one that happened in Connecticut, I think 2012. So this is my anti-gun statement, anti-NRA. So, you know, some people have a one track mind. They can only think about their right to own guns, even if it means assault rifles and all sorts of high powered guns. And I thought, these sort of people aren't people, they're just made out of guns and they don't have a soul. And so this is uh, <laughs> protecting freedom, question mark, is the name of this painting. So someone standing in a doorway armed. Um, so this is sort of my anti-gun statement, but I sometimes I feel some gun enthusiasts could actually like this painting. So that might not be a good thing. <laughs> um, but I usually don't make paintings about social and current, the current social political scene. I think it's a challenge for me, so I, I, don't, I don't do those. Uh, here's another social commentary painting and um, the figure, the NRA is here in the corner. So this painting came first and I, then I made the second painting, which I thought was more effective. So this is a, a book pile. So this appeared in the, the book battle. So a precarious pile of books. So intellectual knowledge, the Tower of Babel, at some point it might collapse on you if you don't pursue other things in life, such as uh, friendship and uh, games and films and other forms of distraction and activity. Um, this is a, another symbolic painting. Someone said it reminded them of a expressionist and neo-something paintings. 
in the twenties, Metropolis, the film. <laughs> um, I, I donated this, I gave this to a friend. This represents my interest in uh, primitive man and women, Neanderthals, Cro-Magnons, Denisovans and Homo erectus and sort of have a romantic feel of all these people living in a hunter-gatherer state. I'm, I'm sure it was a tough life. And uh, I was gonna make a painting of a, the mammoth actually being captured and being carved apart, but then I started to read about elephants and they're very intelligent. And I thought, I just can't bring myself to do such a gruesome, cruel painting. <laughs> I felt bad about the elephants, but you know, they would serve a great meal. Um, they found rocks in a lake in uh, Colorado. And apparently our ancestors were smart enough to kill a mammoth and then they would leave the body in the cold water. And so it was like a refrigerator. So they were well supplied with food for the whole year. Um, so there, um, okay. another scene of Madagascar, uh, really intense Fovist covers, Fovist <laughs> intense colors. I love them, yes. <laughs> uh, another version of the tower, this was painted on a hollow, hollow core door. And uh, unfortunately, this was shown at a golf course somewhere in the northern suburbs. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was told it was, there was marine primer put on it, but it didn't last and the door rotted to my dismay, that, which upset me. Um, uh, another symbolic painting, uh, another symbolic painting, uh, another version of a uh, uh, painting I showed before. Mm -hmm. um, this is called fashion soldier, sort of symbol of uh, uh, cubism here and uh, surrealism, Dada. Um, I've noticed that you have a, these, these different paintings with, with mops and <laughs> and it's, it's, it's regular, it's a regular theme in a, in quite yeah, a few, have... few of your paintings of this particular era. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> this is called cleanup duty. So. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's just sort of a tongue in cheek painting. Oh. I don't think people are scared of people with mops. They shouldn't be. But, uh, You're always holding them like a weapon. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's the scary part. <laughs> um, this is on guard. So this is sort of a reference to uh, clothing and cross-dressing and discomfort and internal conflict. And, and, and here a lot of cubism, expressionism, big, bold, you know, brush strokes. Um, this is from uh, art school. Another version of a uh, cleanup duty. Um, this is a uh, ex sacrifice. So I, I think here the influence of uh, Jose Orozco, the Mexican muralists. I, I really like that sort of heroic mural painting. I, I did my own version here. That will be Jose Clemente Orozco. Yes, yes, <laughs> Orozco, yes, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I like him better than Rivera and Siqueiros. I mean, in terms of painters, I find him the most interesting. Uh, there's another sort of fantasy painting. Um, there's another uh, narrative sort of expressionist, uh, disturbing, dark painting, but using bright colors. Uh, here. We've seen that one. Here's a cool explosion, expressionist <laughs> painting. Uh, here's the, the last woolly mammoth. So I think they've found the last like, woolly mammoth. And... I always loved the woolly mammoth one. Oh. <laughs> in person, this one's really, it's it's a nice sight. It's a nice big painting. That was in, in the show at Coles. Yeah, and it has a lot of color in it. And in person, it's a really nice painting. Yeah, so the only person, well, it's not a person, but a, a maybe a little wolf or, or a dog. The only person who meets the last one now. Here's a reaching upward. Oh, I, I went to Daytona Beach, so I tried to create a painting about all the 
signs you see with advertising religion to join the church and get saved by Jesus and also lots of <laughs> weapons and guns and knives. And it's a strange, strange place, Daytona Beach. <laughs> I went there for work, not for fun. <laughs> um, here's another symbolic painting. Um, these are earlier. Um, here's a recent painting. Melanie has this one. Uh, uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't do it, so I didn't set the alarms. This is a grizzly bear caught on someone's camera in their front yard near Yosemite National Park. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, in, the paint, in, in the photograph, the house isn't on fire, but here I set the house on fire. I think this was painted during the last election when Trump was running for office and won. So I think a lot of people were angry and upset, including me. This is a jumble on the move. This is sort of a grotesque, cartoonish painting. That's unusual. Uh, let me just, collections. Uh, so here I, I do some, uh, I go to Lil Street Art to do some of this type of painting. Um, these are figures and portraits. Um, you can just have a look on different types of models. And, uh, this is from a uh, art school. Um, so I, I keep practicing painting figures. Uh, most of these are not finished. It's hard to finish in two or three, three hour sessions, um, but you do the best you can and you try to keep improving. It's a self-portrait, another self-portrait uh, portrait. Um, so I just wanted to share a few of those and just take a quick look at some prints. Um, I think I've shown this print already. Um, yeah, but it's more close up. Oh, okay. Oh. Yeah, so this is a, a better view of this. This is a pretty large print. It's like 38 inches by 24 inches. This took me like a week to carve. It was, it was down in St. Louis for a workshop. This is was, it linoleum or is it wood? No, it's, it's a birchwood plywood. Oh. It's a large. Okay. Piece of birchwood plywood. Um, here's a recent print I've actually given. I really enjoyed that one. What's the name of that one? I, I think it's Discovery of a New World. Thank you. Yeah. That's really, really wonderful piece. Thank you. Yeah. This... Oh, here's you can see more prints. Um, I have some other prints. Um, I should call up this one. So this, um, I love this one. Yeah. So this is surrealism. So this is the tower, but a different version of the tower. Um, this is an etching with aqua tint. So you can draw the lines with this needle-like sharp instrument, and then you can use a spray gun and spray it. And as you spray it, um, you leave the spray on for like 10, 15, 20 minutes. And it eats into the, uh, the the copper, so it gives you this nice texture. They used to use like sand or for this process, but the spray is the, the better way of doing it now. I didn't do it with the spray. Oh, <laughs> when I was younger. <laughs> oh, okay. I can't what, what? remember how we did it. I think we had like some kind of resist thing that. Oh. Was in the bath. Well, as long as it turns out, I mean. Mm -hmm. it's, Here's a, sometimes I make my paintings into prints. Um, this is a so the the wood chopper I turned into a screen print. Um, this this I was a painting too. Um, the art oh, yes. um, a bonfire. The world turned upside down. Um,
sometimes I've, I've done a few photographs um, of bicycling and uh, I think I... Oh, any squared. Yeah, any squared. I, <laughs> I, 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 I've, I've been participating in the Bike Winter Art Show and the first time I, I, I was there, I showed some paintings, but they didn't sell. So afterwards I, I changed my approach and strategy and I thought, well, you gotta sell stuff like photographs or drawings. And so I took this photo that Gretchen said, hey, you should take a photo of that or share it at the show. And I did, and it's actually the one that sold. So she's a good advisor, a good art evaluator. Um, but this was uh, in our building, there was dripping. Unfortunately, this dripping was is all over Gretchen's room and into the kitchen. <laughs> None of your artwork was damaged. Um, oh my goodness. No artwork was lost, but our kitchen was leaking water and so was a little bit in Gretchen's room. <laughs> During uh, the cold? Yeah, yeah, because all the ice and snow that piled up on the roof uh, was melting. And um, yeah, so. Um, and here's any squared and tracing. So <laughs> I use this photo. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. It's, uh, Thank you. Um, so you, here we can be reminded of what uh, large and inclusive space any squared has been in the past and hopefully will be again in the future. Uh, soon. Uh, when, We're when opening it, up mid. When it's safe. Oh. Well, it'll get, it'll get crowded when it's safe. It'll get crowded. Here's a trailer. So I, I hope to buy a larger trailer like this to transport my big paintings. <laughs> um, it's a future project. There, there's a trailer, um, but I, I, this, I have to. I'll get a special trailer. So this, you transport quite a lot on your trailer. Yeah, <laughs> you do. So that's how I get my art to shows um, on my trailer and my cargo bike. Not bad. That's where you stay on the weekend sometimes. No one stays there now. <laughs> uh, our, our local uh, <laughs> landlord, uh, extraordinaire. Ugh. Uh, he bought not it. A, not a patron of the arts has uh, acquired this building and is sitting on it. And no one's living there for the past five years. It was originally um, an SRO, a single room occupancy, and people lived there. And we don't know where people went after that. <laughs> no one knows <laughs> no but it's it was They're an all important gone. place for a, a bunch of people in the neighborhood no. yeah. it was no. oh that's it it's a nice building yeah and that's the world they could bike ride without <laughs> showing anything too compromising <laughs> but maybe we have a little bit of an open discussion does anyone okay. have any questions or comments about andrea's work Saul, Gretchen. Oh, it's Gretchen. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, Eric. Eric is the bird on the screen. Oh, hey. Bird. Yeah. Hello. Hey. How are you doing? Oh. Uh, I have pants on, by the way. I just. <laughs> Good to know. Wow. I mean, you know, we could just like let us assume. Oh. But anyway. <laughs> Andrea, do you want to share some more from your Instagram? And then I, yeah, I can go just to Instagram and because uh, I think some of the pictures might be a little bigger um, from what you've shown already, and some more. Let's do it. There you go. You're sharing. Oh, okay. Oh, there you go. Whoa. Can, I'll just go down my Instagram page and scroll down if anyone wants me to talk about any art, I can just stop scrolling. Oh, there's a self, is that a self-portrait right in the middle? Yes. yes. Can you click on it and make it bigger? It, is that new? Yes, I took- um, It I've looks very pandemic-y. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Notice the agitator shirt. I was wearing the agitator uh, shirt. How's that with that? I was advertising agitator. <laughs> that was at Lil Street Art Center. They're holding small classes as far well, as I know. No one can. Uh, yeah, that was pastels, right? Co correct, color pastel. Oh, is yeah. that pastel? I didn't realize. Yes, color pastel. So, um, as far as I, it's pretty safe there. It's an old factory building, and as far as I know, no one's gotten sick. I haven't gotten sick. People wear their mask. 
So um, I think if everyone's pretty diligent, you can be safe. Uh, and so I can keep mm. scrolling down. And some of these others are, this This is two a color pastel and we just did still and, lines, color pastel. And Andrew, could you speak on the one uh, at the top right? You're, there are two, put, yes, no, this right. One? Right? This yes, one? yes, yes. I saw the owl in your, uh, yeah. There was something underneath your feet. I wanted to know, like seeds or walnuts? Acorns. Oh, this is an earlier version of these paintings. Those are, these are just like little plants, pine plants. They're not, it's not clear. <clears throat> on the right they're... one, what's underneath? Oh, on the right one? Yeah. Oh, those are walnuts. Oh, okay. I, I think I, I, I I've turned, I turned actually those into pine cones in a later version. Oh, okay. I, thought, I think the later oh. version is up on your Instagram. Yeah, walnuts. Let's, let's go back to the earlier. Was there a certain feeling or thought you had in mind when you put those in or whenever you switched them? That looks like corn or? Oh, it's pine cones. So the pine, pine cones, cones, sorry. Pine sorry. cones go with pines, walnuts go with walnut trees. So I, I, I thought just be consistent. <laughs> Understood. Understood. I like the look of the walnuts, but then I thought, but you've got pine trees in the paintings. Hmm. So I, I like I'm just trying to be consistent. I got you. I'm sure the art critics would have been like, what are these walnuts doing here? <laughs> <laughs> what does it mean? What does it mean? Yeah, I, I thought, well, you're just being confusing for not a good reason. Oh. <laughs> oh. I, I, I don't know. I, I could, just. Could you show the one with the owl, too? Yeah. Is that one? Um, that one out of, um, there's a whole series of these paintings. Oh, that's so radiant. The, wow. Radiating, right? Yes. So, you like owls and goats. Yes. <laughs> a particular thing about that, or I don't know. <laughs> Owls, I, I think, I don't know, they're sort of secretive and they fly silently in the night. And mm. I guess rodents live in terror of them because their lives can end soon or quickly. <clears throat> I don't know, it's sort of a bird of mystery and wisdom. So it's. Mm. So you're saying fun. you're not a part of the Illuminati? <laughs> oh, I, I don't think so. <laughs> okay. You haven't gotten your uh, letter yet. I mean, I, I am interested. I've been listening to, uh, if anyone's um, here is into psychedelics um, and the Lucian Mysteries, uh, Brian yeah. Murarescu. He's got- mm. Who is that? If you do, is oh, that he, like uh, the leader of uh, Satanic Church? No, no, he's like a lawyer. He's a corporate sports lawyer. And oh, so he's definitely a saint. Hey. No he's married. He's married. He looks like he's forty years old. He looks like a youthful young man. Um, Understood. He, he he writes about the um, the immor the immortality key, the religion mm -hmm. with no name, and so it's a. Uh, he yeah. speculates that during the Luc the Lucinian mysteries and the ancient Greeks, including Plato, Socrates, and others, took something that, which was like a psilocybin or some type of psychedelic drug. Oh, okay. Had an Possibly. Experience. I, I'm into that stuff. I've been listening for hours as I've been painting this work actually to uh, his interviews and talks um, hmm. about sort of the out of body experience and even all the celebrities, the, the big names of you know the ancient Greek world would take this. And uh, wow. These seem like religious paintings to me. Uh, um, yes. The birth canal, I mean, but in a in a not not Christian way, and even beyond paganism, as we commonly think of it um, yeah, totally. nowadays. Yes, there's, uh, there's spiritual foundational stuff, and it, there's birth canals. There's there's death. There's light. Um, it, it, there's a, a darkness. Um, mystical creatures. It's it's loaded with imagery. Totally um, loaded. It could be an altarpiece. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. Exactly. It's 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 sort of a new. It's sort of spirituality without a denomination. I I hope. Yeah. yeah I was waiting for you to bring that up because it it's it. It, it, it seems like in the last couple of years, it's gone more in that direction. They're very strong paintings, but they're also disturbing in, oh. in an 
new and different way. They're powerful and disturbing. Oh, thank, you. thank you. I thought these would be pleasant or reassuring. <laughs> it's all a question of perspective, I guess. Oh, okay. <laughs> peaceful. I think they're peaceful and sort of like eagle. Yeah, I thought, I thought these were supposed to all be positive paintings, like, like, after me. They're like, you know, you got to work for your piece, right? You got to, oh. like, you got to go through something to get there. Oh, True. okay. Which, which is good. It's there. It makes it interesting. Absolutely oh, okay. valuable. I don't know. Yeah, you realize the value of it. <sighs> oh, that's my cat. <laughs> Changing. Okay, I can just scroll hey. back. Speech Kahas is really like digging the spotlight. Yeah, he's right next to me. I can't. Um, yeah, so I, I, I've turned to Instagram to post my recent work. And uh, so here you can see I, I made like sketches of some of the paintings I, I worked on recently. Oh, God, I love the one on blue. That is so cool looking. <laughs> With the what? horns, the stripy horns, like bottom, below oh, yeah. the, uh, that one. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> just so intense. <laughs> um, this is the last, I think this is from uh, Bigger Tuesdays. So this is one of the sword. Is that Andrew? This is Andrew Rose Vickers, any squared model. And that's I added color. The striped platform, cool. That's the striped platform. More movement, more color. <laughs> more stripes more stripes well it's a cheap way of introducing movements I, I i realize oh, i know i like stripes so i do too it's uh so i think we're gonna start wrapping up the recorded okay. part and we can continue the discussion afterwards okay but uh does anyone have any any uh questions that they've been wanting to ask and haven't asked yet anybody <laughs> so we're going to wrap up the wrap up the the recorded part and thank you Andrea for doing the art talk. Oh, thanks for inviting um, me. And yeah. I'm so happy that you're on and actually I'm going to stop sharing the screen. Okay. Uh can I just mention that um Can you stop sharing the screen for a second? Oh. Yeah. And then and then we can wrap it up. Okay. So, thank you so much. So what, what did you want to mention? Oh, just one more reminder. So if anyone wants to learn more about the paintings, go to Agitator Magazine, issue number two. Go to the Agitator Magazine, the, and web, the website. And so there's a long description of, of paintings and what I think about them and what they mean. If you scroll up the chat, there's the link there. You can find it too. Yeah, so there's, there's more information about them there. And, and also there's a link to my book. So I, I talk more about my art from my past in my, in my book. I self-publish a book on Amazon and there should be a link there too. If anyone is curious. Just scroll up. There's a few links on here and, and you can find them. Yeah, and a, a section of the book is for free. So you don't have to buy it. You can just read excerpts from it. I saw that today. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's I, all. But, yeah. So, so if you want to learn more about the art, it's the, the writings there about it. So thank you so much, thank you. Thank Andrea, you for the talk. Yay! <laughs> we're we're going to take off. It was really cool to see and hear about yeah. you. Well, thanks for attending, yeah, everyone. Really, yeah, yeah, it was really nice. Thank you. Very thank cool. you, everyone. Thank Yay, you. thank you. Check social media for future Zooms and future streams. Thank you to Hairpin Art Center for being our streaming partner. Thanks for watching. <laughs>